What would it take for you to set your alarm for 4 a.m.? How about talking to Lee Dixon? This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Alex Smith, the Man, Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Uh, that's right. That's what you're going to get today. Uh, a special bonus podcast. So my intention had been to put this interview into a regular podcast, but Lee was so generous with his time that I think I'm just going to put this out as a regular pod. And uh, then we'll have another pod for you. So it's a pod bonanza, but this one is special. Um, Lee Dixon is the voice of the Premier League uh, for NBC these days. So as an American, I get to hear him every weekend. He's, he's part of my family's weekend. Obviously, though, he's also part of our weekends uh, years ago as a player and, and a player who won just about everything with Arsenal European trophies, league trophies, FA Cup trophies. Um, obviously, the, the famous league victory uh, at Anfield in 89, got to play for George Graham, got to play for Arsene Wenger. And so to be able to speak to Lee is obviously uh, something that I feel very fortunate about. Didn't know how much time I would get, so tried to hit some topics that I thought would be uh, interesting to him. And he just spoke as he ever does, uh, articulately, eloquently on the topic. And I think uh, one of the reasons he was willing to come on in the first place is to help support our uh, fundraiser for the Arsenal Foundation. So look, there's one day left of our month-long fundraiser. We are over goal already. And and obviously that's just a reflection of your generosity. And it, it's it's fantastic. It's breathtaking. Now I'm asking if we can smash that goal just a little bit more, show Lee the influence that he has uh, in coming on to inspire that. Uh, you can go to arsenalvisionpodcast.com forward slash donate. Uh, you'll click a button there to take you right to the Just Giving campaign and all the funds go right to the foundation. So I don't want to uh, waffle on for too long. It is 4.48 a.m. right now, and so my brain is still sort of in neutral. Uh, but thankfully, Lee did all the important work. So I will uh, turn it over to myself and Lee Dix, and I hope you enjoy this and another podcast coming out for you a, a bit later as well. And so it is now my great pleasure to introduce Lee Dixon, not that I need to introduce Lee Dixon. I will try to dispense with the obsequy and fawning, uh, although it is in my nature to want to do it. Uh, firstly, just thank you so much for being here, Lee. I can't tell you how much it means to me and to draw a last bit of attention to our to our fundraiser for the Arsenal Foundation. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I'm sorry to get you up so early. <laughs> <laughs> 4 a.m.? Come on. I mean, you know, I, I've woken up for kickoffs not too much, too much earlier than this. Um, so... The first thing I want to ask you about is the obvious place to start is Tomiyasu, right? I mean, because uh, he plays your position, but in, in a very different way. And he okay. was voted man of the match in the Derby. And I think it's just so interesting seeing the new players come in and Tomiyasu in particular, starting in the, ba the back three and build up <clears throat> and the way he plays that right back position. I'm curious to get your thoughts on his early start to life at Arsenal and the very different way that Arteta is using the right back position now. Yeah, I mean, mo most players uh, we see nowadays play the position slightly differently than I, than I played it uh, <laughs> years ago anyway. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't know, I have to be honest, and I suppose it's the same with most of the Arsenal um, fan base out there. I didn't know too much about him before he came. Um, I just kind of... He, I, he was on the radar. I'd heard, I've heard about him. I heard obviously the rumors leading up to him signing. Um, so sometimes that's a good thing because you don't have any preconception about what what's expected of him. He comes in really with a blank canvas from my point of view. So you go, okay, right, we've signed this player. What what does he offer? And uh, and as you said, he, he you know he's, he he plays the game um, different. The fullback position. The, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of myth and um, and kind of rubbish talks about football these days. In, in in my understanding of it, I'm sure I'm guilty of a lot of it. So I'm excited to hear, <laughs> well, to hear this part. Listen, <laughs> this is me too. Um, and also, I, I've got I have to be careful when I'm talking about players and and the game because I you know it was a it was a while ago that I was playing at that level. Um, so you have to remind yourself that the game's moved on. That the the um, that the positions on the pitch have slightly changed. But I also have to remind myself as well, and I do this a lot, is that there's a lot of talk about systems, formations, that is just talk and it's just... In, and and you can get wrapped up in it, in, in it a little bit too much at times. And, I, and I've been guilty of it myself, of going, yeah, but they're playing a... You know, they're playing three at the bat and the full bats pushed in and and this this five across and Pep's pulling his full backs into this position and the, as if it's never happened before. 
And everything you've seen on a football pitch today, this is my belief. So, you know, shoot me down if you, if you think it, I'm not saying the right Unlikely. thing. <laughs> disagree with it. And, and that's absolutely fine because it is about opinions. All I'm doing is basing my opinions on some experience about playing at, at, at a certain level that I can share with people. That's, that's all being a pundit is all about. It's not telling telling this is right, this is wrong. I think sometimes when you, oh God, I'm going off track a little bit here, but I'll get I'll get back to the answer in a minute. <laughs> um, I think sometimes you can get wrapped up in say, you know, get, looking at systems and everything other. Like if you if you break it right back down again, the idea of the game is to outwit the opponent and put the ball into their net, and the opposite of that is to is to stop them trying to outwit you and keep the ball out of the other net. And that is it. If you break it straight down, that is all that the game is about. And whether you're playing Pep style, tiki taka, going through the midfield and scoring goals and, and, and playing a wonderful game, or you're slightly hitting it a little bit longer and you're hitting passes into the into the wide areas, getting ball in the box and heading the ball in the net, then ultimately it's all about winning football matches. So when we break it down to that, you look at a player like Tommy Asu or what he's being asked to do and how he plays the game. My job, my job when I was playing in that position was ultimately not rule number one, keep the ball out of the net. And that was all, you know, if I did that, it doesn't matter what else I did on the pitch, that was enough. And if you if you if you say that to the modern day fan and the modern day coach or anything like that, and you go, it, it, ultimately, they would agree with it with me. They'd go, mm-hmm. "Yeah, I know, but the game's changed, and he's doing this, this, and this." Mm-hmm. Fine, I don't, I don't. So ultimately, I, I he will be judged by me about how many times we keep clean sheets, how good a defender he is, how much of a relationship he creates with his centre back. Ben White on that side looks like he's settling down. They could go on and create a partnership that the partnerships. My strength as a fullback was my centre half. Um, you know, it was it was Tony Adams in the day bit when Boldy played on the left, and then after that, Martin came in. So my relationship with Martin Keown and Tony Adams was what made me a, a, a half decent defender because we kept the ball out of the net more times than we didn't. So that's where I chose it. So having said that, he's very um, athletic. You know, I could run a bit when I was a kid, when I was a bit younger. Maybe not as uh, not as strong aerially as he looks. You know, he looks mm. like he's he's you know he's obviously centre back, full back material anyway, and we know that. Um, so I've been impressed with him coming in. I've been impressed with other players who've come in um, in the start of their Arsenal career. I think you know if we look back at. Um, fullbacks coming into a back four it's always nice to come into one that's playing reasonably well and you can form relationships and go right okay and be settled that's not really what has happened over the years at Arsenal um, we've had a lot of problems at centre-back since since players left so creating those relationships is, is very difficult Arteta hopefully will coach him into a, the type of fullback he wants him to be it's very early in the day to jump out your uh, off your chair and go. We've signed a world beater. He's going to be, he's going to be this, that, and the other. I tend to give fullbacks, you know, quite a while to settle in. It took me a while. Fortunately, when I got in the side, I was cup tied. I couldn't play in the league cup. So when I signed for Arsenal, George put me in, made my debut, took me out for two weeks, put me in. I only played six games from February to the end of the season. So I, I watched a lot. Sometimes you play and you learn your best games when you're sitting on the bench watching. Uh, he's straight in, and because he's so dynamic and played so well, it looks like he's going to be in. So he's going to have to learn on his feet, and that can sometimes be difficult. And he'll ride the roller coaster for a few week games. And hopefully, we go on a bit of a run now, and he can be in a confident position. But if we if we had a if we were playing Man City, Liverpool, Man United, Chelsea over the next few weeks, I'd be a little bit concerned that. It's going to all come at him very, very quickly. We, he's got a little bit of time now to go settle in. So that was a very long answer to answering your question. I, I like what I see so far. <laughs> it, it spares me having to talk at 4 a.m. So I appreciate you taking that burden off me. Um, well, and, and I think also, you know, Spurs, and I'm I'm not sure why, sort of played to his strength. They, they hit a lot of long balls into Sun, and it seems like aerial dominance, aerial duels is a strength of his. So yeah. he looked very comfortable with that. Um, 
but you, you hit on something that actually I had written down here because you had a quote uh, from years ago saying I was fortunate to play in an Arsenal backline that earned itself a reputation as being okay. I'm not trying to be overly modest in saying that. As individuals, we weren't the best players in the world, but certainly all my weaknesses were compensated for by Tony Adams, Nigel Winterburn, Martin Keown, and Steve Bold, and vice versa. If one of us wasn't playing while well, the others picked up the slack. And you sort of touched on this, Lee. I think what is really exciting to me looking at the back five, let's call them five because you have Ramsdale in there too now. <coughs> Tierney's the oldest at 24. You have yeah. Gabriel, 23, White at 23, Tomiyasu, I, I believe, 22, and Ramsdale at 23. And they come in in a similar period and can have that run together. And they look like they compensate each other in terms of strengths and weaknesses. White isn't as strong in the air, for, for my view, but he can stride out, carry the ball, pass well, intercept. Gabriel's physical and dominant. Ramsdale seems to be a good communicator and stitch it all together. Tierney bombs up the wing. Tomiyasu stays back. So as someone who had that dynamic that you talked about, a group that played together for a long time, yeah. developed together, and complemented each other, having seen Arsenal go through the David Luizes and Socrates and Pablo Marie and Mustafi and the sort of revolving door of, of a back line and trying Chambers and Bellerin at right back and, and Maitland-Niles, do you think that the strength of this group is that they can develop that rapport over time and that their, their traits sort of complement one another? It could be, it, mm. and that's the thing. I think it's very exciting, that back line. Um, you know, the, the the one thing that stands out for me is we all got brought together at similar age. Tony Adams was a, was the captain and he was, you know, established in the late 80s. Um, when I came to the club, Nigel came just before me, Steve Bowl came just after me. So, and we were young, I was 23, same, same sort of age. And mm -hmm. absolutely, you pointed that out. What I need to see now when I'm looking at them is I need to see a program of forget the pit, forget the games for a minute. I need to see a program of development on the training pitch from Monday to Friday. Let's suggest that there's no games in midweek. So Monday to Friday, they are working on a on a regular basis like we did. They're getting coached in a way that um, enables them to uh, learn the art of playing together, and and that's. You know, and creating that environment where they don't have to be the best individually in the world, it helps if you're de decent as well. But you can form, and we are the prime example of that. Like you post, like you pointed out, to be able to create relationships and strengths in that back four. Let's take the goalie out for a minute. Um, in that back four, to enable the people around them to have confidence as well to play their own game without worrying about what's going on at the back. Where it falls down, where it breaks down, is when you've got four young, let's call them young men, in those very vital positions that can make or break a, a team in 90, in 90 minutes. If your defence doesn't work, then you're struggling at the other end to get enough goals to win the game. So in, in order for them to be able to, to do that week in, week out, it's fine when they play, no disrespect to Norwich, Burnley and a very, very poor Tottenham team who played in a way that was like, I can't even work it out now. You know, I've watched the tape again. I'm like, am I, what, am I seeing things here? So, <laughs> we, so you take those three games and I know the check, the team was slightly different, whatever you on the, uh, each of those games, but you take the back four in those games, everything was on a, you know, Tommy Asu, uh, the same thing that you said with Ben White, everything was on a plate for them in that game. They didn't have to defend anything that was tricky for them because it was it was all, as you said, very straightforward to, you know, Harry Kane dropping in midfield, big long balls. Mm. It, it was just chaos. So beautiful game for them to play. North, you could, you know, I would have had a smile on my face the whole 90 minutes there. Not so much the heading because I've got Martin to do all of that. <laughs> um, but the actual under pressure bit that they struggled to deal with, would have struggled to deal with it at times and made it very difficult, didn't happen. So when they come against the big teams, and we saw it against Chelsea, you know, that that back line against Chelsea had no clue, you know, Mari was playing in there. They had no clue how to deal with Lukaku. Yeah. Now, when you've got four lads who are very inexperienced and, and a problem comes up, we we had the solution on the we'd have the solution 
presented to us on a, on a Monday to Friday in training and we worked it out. We were intelligent football brains and we worked it out with George Graham how we solve problems on the pitch. They couldn't solve that problem on the pitch and they didn't have anybody on the pitch who could say, hang on a minute, I'll sort this out. Forget the manager for a minute because he he's 40 yards away shouting stuff that you never li- really listen to anyway. You can hardly <laughs> ignore him most of the time. Um, you need to sort those problems and put those fires out on the pitch. They had no clue what to do, Lukaku. So they got hammered. Let's face it, against Chelsea, they they were like... It was like men against boys. So from that point of view, that's where that's where I would be worried and that's concerned. But and you don't build that overnight. That takes time. So they have to learn that quickly. They, if we get another Lukaku, what do we do? Do us do 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 Mari just fight him from behind all the time? That's not going to work. So you've got to play narrow and you've got to allow Mari no responsibilities. You've got to take the responsibilities of everything else off the pitch away from him by being narrow and compact and go, if you want to nip in front of him, nip in front of him. In fact, go and stand in front of him. So when you're you're asking the midfield player to come and stand on his toes, that takes the midfield player out of his position. You go and stand in front of him. Mm. What's he going to do then? Well, he'll run behind. Well, he won't because my fullback and my centre half have dropped off. So we've got cover. You can go and stand in front of him. Then once the ball doesn't go to him, You've solved one of the problems. You've put one of the fires out. Then you have to put another one out. Then you have another one out. So I'm very excited about that. I like what I see. And I think it could be the base to go on to better things. They've got to learn quickly and they've got to learn it on the training pitch. And before the big games come round, build a bit of confidence and then be able to say, do you know what? We can handle Lukaku. If if we're playing against Salah and, and Liverpool stretching as wide with the two wingers really wide, what do we do then? How do we play as a wide back four as opposed to playing against Chelsea when you have to play as a narrow back four? So there's all of that to learn. And believe me, it took us eight, nine years, ten years before people started. I mean, people were saying, oh, the defence is not bad, but you you build a leg, <clears throat> excuse me, you build a legacy and a reputation over five to ten years. You know, yeah. the odd year here and the odd game here and the good game is is great, builds confidence. But in order for people to we only we only looked upon as the great back four of Arsenal now. At the time we were decent and we were good and we were very, you know, people say, oh they're really but the legacy, people forget about the bad games we have now. They, they only really re, re, remember, God, that back four was brilliant, wasn't it? I watched some tapes of me playing and I was going, wow, that's, that's terrible. You know, I can <laughs> analyse myself now. But in general, over 38 games, you, you, you keep the ball out of the net more than, than you don't, then you're doing all right. Well, you didn't have any Twitter coaches at the time telling you where to stand and how to play the game. So you had that advantage. Very, that's a very good point. Um, well, I mean, if if experience is something that has to come quickly at the back line, there's a lot of youth up front as well. And and one thing I wanted to make sure to talk to you about is just two very special Hale End products uh, yeah. making their mark right now in Saka and Smith Rowe. Yeah. You know, giving players that age, the seven, the 10, asking them to have that responsibility, it's a lot. They certainly look like they could handle it in the Derby. Uh, there will be ups and downs because of their age, but I'm curious... What does it mean, you know, both to, to players in the team, I can I can speak only as a fan and, how, and the connection I feel, but having players that have come through the academy that know what it means to be Arsenal, that have that connection to the club, and do you think that their presence in that team is important, setting aside how they play, but th- that they are forming a foundation for this squad with that connection to the club and just generally how impressed are you with them at this age? Because I think for a lot of fans, myself included, my hope for Arsenal to return to us a, a standard that I, I sort of expect from the club feels very much tied to their development. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, when I first came to the club, <clears throat> the club was um, a, a huge uh, establishment. It was like a beacon of, of uh, how things should be run, how things should be done. We prided ourselves and I I was told about all the traditions and the um and the kind of almost uh religious things that needed to go on to be an Arsenal player. You know, mm. th- there were certain standards, there were certain protocols, 
And I was hugely impressed by that when I came and it really struck with me. And I was a I was I'd only been to London once. I was a kid from Manchester signing at 23, 24 into this huge football club that was a very scary place for me. And I was like, wow. But what the one thing that that settled me down and, and didn't make me so fearful was the fact that there was traditions and there was things I could hold on to. And I, and I realised from an early age that I loved all that. And I, the fact that, you know, that Arsenal was the Arsenal and not just Arsenal, but, you know, the, the, the word, the T-H-E in front of it, people call us the Arsenal. And I was like, wow, what's all that about? And I wanted to learn about it. I wanted to understand that. And I got it really quickly. And because of the kids, the, and I call them kids, some of them are older than me, the Paul Davis, um, Tony Adams was captain. He was obviously younger than me. Um, David Rodecastle, all of these guys, Michael Thomas, they, they're real lifeblood of the club, come through the academy. They were all academy kids. Um, and they, they'd been, that had been drilled into them from a, an early age. And I had not, I'd never really witnessed that at the clubs I'd been at because I was flitting from one to the other. I didn't really, I wasn't really settled, get free transfer and then I left Chester and I was at smaller clubs. Not that smaller clubs can't have tradition, they can, of course. But this juggernaut I was going into was like, wow. And all these kids were telling me, you know, remember who you are, what you are and who you represent. And we go to a game and we're all suited and booted and the cannons on your chest. I mean, that makes you feel like a million dollars. You could go and smash down walls. And these kids were passing this on to me. And I was like, wow, my first North London dar derby, which I've talked about before, is I was threatened before I went out by the by the, the Arsenal kids to say, you better play well today because this is our game. We're playing Tottenham. And I was like, wow, OK, I'll do my best. <laughs> and I, and I, so I, I got that. I got the fact that your shirt had to be tucked into your shorts. I got the fact that we all wore the same sleeves, long the captain had long, we all had long. If he had short, we had short. I loved all that it could, because you can gain strength from that. You can go, do you know what? People are looking at us and going, when we get off that coach on an away game, and I, I do it with Man United now because they, they were a similar type of organisation to us where they had the same sort of principles. They get off the coach and they're all suited and booted and that Man United badge and you go, wow, they look like they come to play. You don't get off with your you know, I mean, now it, it, it kind of gets me a little bit when I see players now getting off in this t in their tracksuits and mm. some have got their tops on, some have got the tops off, they've got headphones on. <laughs> you know, they kind of, they just don't look like that. You know, I want to get off that coach and I want to go and I, I want to, you know, put my chest Set out. Set the and tone, look, yeah. Yeah, and I want to look at the the opposition, not, not just the players, because you don't see the players when you arrive, but I want to see the members of staff at, Everton or whatever and when they look at you and I go yeah right I've come here and I'm going to go I'm come here to win and they that goes round the ground you soon Arsenal are here you know it's like mm -hmm. wow so to set that you need to have that traditions and we we pass that on and I say we because I've I sit, I'm a gooner so I and I got it early so I was like I'm going to pass this on to Patrick Vieira Manu Petit and Perez and and Wiltor and when they come into my club I'm going to tell them this is how we do things. And if you don't do it, and believe me, a few of them didn't when they first came, then we will tell them that that's not acceptable. Get your shirt tucked in. Stop, you know, put your socks up, all of that sort of stuff. You might think, what's that got to do with winning three points? Huge. It's huge. So these kids now that you're talking about, they have, they know that. They've been, it's, it's diluted a little bit because there's no doubt that the, the introduction of foreign players over the years dilutes that. We try to install it into... You ask Thierry Henry, Patrick Vieira, about the traditions of the club. It's in there. Mm. Thierry talks about it. He he was speechless when he saw how we treated him when he came. Obviously, with open arms, we, we want him to do well, but you don't mess about with our football club. This is what's happened. If you don't toe the line and, and you don't set your example to the others, then we'll be on your back. And these kids now growing up, and they've taken to the first team like a duck to water. And I've got no, I've got, I've got no concerns about. Oh yeah, but kids, you get a level of performance and then it drops off because um, it's very hard to maintain that. They, they've gone through that. They, Smith Rowe, Saka, 
uh, th- they've gone to a place that they go, do you know what? You can see their chest is up and high. I mean, Smith Rowe, the way he talks about scoring his first goal, or making his debut, that's Tony Adams, that's David Rowcastle, bless him, that's Michael Thomas. So it's back in the club and that gives me more delight than than any other performances, results. I know that the, the club's um, integrity is safe in their hands and they need to be applauded for that and they also need to pass that on to everyone. And it doesn't... It, it, it doesn't have to be just to the players that are younger than them at Hale End or the other kids, because that should be being done by the coaches. But even to the, you know, any player who comes into the club, I I, I always took it upon myself to say to people who came to the club, just go, yeah, you look great. You know, you've got a good touch in training and did all of that stuff. I need to talk to you about this. Mm. You know, Lauren came in to take my position and I, instead of uh, fighting it, I realised I was 38. I realised that he was going to take over. So do you know what? I'm going to take. I'm going to help him as best I can because I want him to. I want that number two shirt, and that's a figure of speech, whether he's number two or not. I want that number two shirt to go to somebody that had the same care about the club that that I did, and make sure that I was passing it over. So what does he need? Does he need? He needs a bit of help. I need to. I need to give him everything I've got and tell him about all of that stuff. And I'm, these boys are going to do that. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, and I mean, I, I know he, like Murdasacker didn't come through the academy, but he feels like someone who really cares about the club. He's guiding the academy now, and I feel like he's <clears> someone who would care about those traditions and, and pass those right messages down. You know, uh, Arteta, for whatever time he's got at the club, I mean, he he played. He played under Arsene Wenger. He was there at a time, you know, when I think – Arsenal was still at least closer to the standard that we expect. So you'd like to think that there's some continuity there. Um, I, I'll let you go because I've already kept you longer than I said I would, no, but I, no. I've got one quick one well, for you. Now you might as well, you might as well make the most of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I appreciate it. I'll go, go as long as you want. Trust me. Um, well, so, so then two quick things. The first is just, um, I think Arsenal finally took some bitter medicine this summer that they had to, you know, there were a lot of, short-term solutions that were tried to, to kind of yeah. sneak back into top four and who knows what the plan was from there. But this summer, when you look at the signings, all of them under 24, um, yeah. all six of them finishing the game together in the Derby, we don't know where it'll go, but it felt like a necessary reset. And it's hard for a club of our stature and the way you've just talked about, you know, I say our club, I'll, I'll say your club to be fair, but oh, you know, I the club that I love. Yeah, yeah. share it with you. Um, you know, it, it, it feels like a perilous moment because the money flowing into some of those clubs in the top four and some of the caliber of talent that they're bringing in, we took a big risk here. I'm curious if you see it as the right kind of risk committing to a sort of reset, or if you have some questions about whether this approach can get us to close the gap, given what's happening at some of those other other clubs right now. There's no doubt that, um, that what you, you pointed out is totally accurate. I think, the short term fixes i was dubious about some of the signings that we made and and the, not on the eye but we we've all been proved right in that and i think arteta has realized certainly with sitting down with the hierarchy and edu and and working out that that strategy and that amount of outlay on wages etc was a waste of money it might have worked it didn't so okay so after applaud the club to say okay well done to spend the huge amount of money that they've spent, uh, they could have given it all away in wages to the to the likes that have, you know been and come and gone. That we we don't need to talk about them. Mm-hmm. They're not Arsenal players in my in my well, they're not anymore anyway. So <laughs> they've gone. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have to applaud the club for for changing their strategy, and it is a big risk. But if something doesn't work, then to do the same thing. That's the you know that's the the definition of insanity. So uh, thankfully we didn't go down that road again. So what's the other options? Well, the other options are we sort of mix and match. Most clubs kind of do that. They need a bit of experience, and they go, do you know what? We might need to take a player that people will go. Well, you can steady the ship sometimes in certain situations, or we go the full other way. Well, there's another option. You don't sign anybody and just bring all the kids from Hale End in and see how good that gets you. And, <laughs> and that would suggest, because of the size of that job and where we've dropped, how 
how our stock has dropped so low, that would have been a massive risk. So I think they've gone for the middle one and gone, do you know what? Let's sign some, let's spend some money, but let's do it in a way that's um, build it. A little bit like, not to the extent of money-wise, but what George did when he came, he had a lot of experienced players that were kind of lost their hunger. Um, and he looked at them and said, right, I've got a load of good kids. So Arteta's got a load of good kids. Got a load of good kids. How do, what do I do? If I spend massive amount, then <clears throat> that's the risk that they've just gone through. So the other option is sign a load of players. So I don't <clears throat> what's going on with my throat this morning. It's because it's early in the morning. You, I'm feeding it through the internet to you, the yeah. 4 a.m. feeling. <laughs> so the other option is spend some money, quite a lot of money, and try and sign players that we think we can build on. That's the difficult bit from a recruitment point of view now because everybody's over everything. George, George, he went out to the lower leagues and he went, right, what's out there? Who's hungry? Who's talented? And he did a huge amount of research. In those days, there wasn't the the, the resources that they've got nowadays. So he went out and, and trod the boards. He went out and watched me at Berry playing, you know, Stoke playing a berry away from home on a cold Tuesday night. All his staff were doing that. Bold, Winterburn, Dixon, players like that, Alan Smith, Perry Groves, brought all these players in. So it's, it's a similar way. They've invested in youth, but good youth who've mm. got a bit, a bit of talent and a bit of experience and all that lot. It's still a risk because these players coming in now, we're, we're singing our Tomiyasu. Wow, brilliant. Right, he's done. No, he's got another three years of development before we say <laughs> he's done and he's going to be okay. So it is a risk now. They've invested in Arteta because to, for him to spend that money with that program of development, you've got you can't sack him now. You can't go, oh, we'll sack him because the new manager's coming in, going, well, I don't, I don't really want those players. If if Conte came in now, if he went and Conte came in, you went, he'd go, he'd look at that. He go, he want instant. I want that. He's not going to take that project because he's going, no, I'm, I'm not that type of manager. I want the project to be working. I want to challenge top four now. Why would I go to Arsenal with these kids that I've got to develop? So you're in a position where you've kind of invested in the manager. So we can all have our opinions whether Arteta's the right man for the job. And I'm, you know, I'm still the jury's out as far as um, plan B and all of the stuff that we have concerns about. But he's got his heart in the club. We give him a load of players who have, expensive we spent a load of money go and develop him I believe his trainer I've not been on the training ground I believe his training is really good he's a really good coach that side of it I don't think is a problem I think the managerial match day situation is where he will be judged ultimately mm. they all are because if you don't get three points people go you don't know what you're doing so it's a risk but it's an exciting risk because we saw what they did at the weekend how brilliant you know how brilliant that was if they can just get Two of the two performances out of four like that every week, and the other two you scrape and you're not quite so good, but you nick a win or a draw. Then you'll see the path going like that, and then you'll start getting into the top six, and you'll put huge amount of work. And all, do you know what, Elliot? It's all on the training ground. Yeah. Well, the good news for these new players, they get to come in and and be greeted by an atmosphere like they they were greeted by in the, in the derby. And I'll just ask you. I mean, as someone who has to go into these grounds every weekend and and call the game, it must be such a joy for you to have that back, to have the fans back in the stadium. I I know, you know, I'm going to be at the Palace game. I can't wait to be a part of that energy and that atmosphere. But even just the way it transmits through the screen when you're watching thousands of miles away, it totally changes the game. I'm sure it does for players as well. Um, And for you, I'm guessing it makes the job a lot more fun. (laughs) Yeah, when you say I have to go into these grounds, I, well, I choose. You're to go lucky. To go in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it is a. It, you don't realise how much the fans have been missed because I got used to, you know, for that period of time, I got used to the fans not being there. Yeah. Because it made my job a huge amount easier because I could turn up at the ground a lot later. I left the ground as soon as the game finished. Mm. I was home probably an hour and a half to two hours earlier than I was. So you get into a routine, you go, do you know what? I'll turn the fans up in my ear. You know, I'll turn them up in my ear. And you've got noise in your ears and you go, do you know what? Today I think we should have this volume. And you you do the commentary and you kind of get used to it. 
But deep down, there is a yearning for that. And 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 it's only when they've come back now that you go. And I, I sampled it, obviously, in the Euros uh, with England at Wembley. Yeah. I mean, the, some of the atmospheres at, at Wembley watching England play was just, wow, this is, this is it. And then leading up to the start of Premier League, it was, I can't wait to get back to full stadiums. And, and some of the atmospheres this season have been really astonishing. And you, you come into the Palace game is... It's going to really it double hits you when when there's an atmosphere like the weekend, and I think uh, everybody now is going, "Wow, th- this is football's back!" And I think the level of performances that players shown during the pandemic or the the close shot pandemic when there's no fans there was extraordinary from players' point of view. I think we saw when it first happened, we we were getting freak results of you know. 6-3 and 6-4s mm-hmm. and all these goals. And it was like, it was a really weird period. It settled down and then we started to see a bit of normality from a football point of view. But I think now, certainly with the way that refereeing is <clears throat> changed a bit as well and the referee relationship, is, it's not perfect, but it's it's a bit better. Things are starting to be, feel a bit more like normal. And, uh, um, you know, normal for me is is seen not not so much recently in recent years, but normal for me is seeing Arsenal challenging, and I want I'm desperate for those days to get back because I'm I'm sick of everybody at NBC taking the Mickey out of me. All, you know, <laughs> we're not talking about Arsenal this week because you, you're not high enough in the table and mm. stuff like that. So goes in circles and cycles. We'll be back at some point. Yeah, believe me, I'd rather our games be on NBC than Peacock if we can. I mean, <laughs> no, love the Peacock service, don't get me wrong. Well, I, I'll, I'll leave it there. And I just want to say, you know, personally, you're a part of our family. You know, our weekends, your voice is a part of our our family and our home. My my daughters, my wife, you know, when I told them I'd be talking Sorry about that. that. That's the guy. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, it's hugely appreciated. And, um, <clears throat> you know, you do an amazing job. I wouldn't say concealing your love for the club because I don't think you do that. But, you know, calling the game in a way that is that is fair and equitable, even if I'd rather you didn't. So, uh, <laughs> Lee, thank you so much. I know you obviously, um, you know, are very philanthropic yourself and the – uh, sports relief is a cause that you've ridden your bike for. And and so if there's anything you want to plug or, or recommend to people, you know, certainly want to give you that opportunity, but I also just want to say thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Uh, you know, anything Arsenal related, whether, you know, it be podcasts, foundation, um, raising awareness, not just Ray. I mean, it's not all about just raising money. It's about raising awareness and awareness then leads into people being in a position where they might want to support, you know, a, a charitable cause or the foundation or whatever it is. So it's about just, it's about just, commu- I think these things are all about communication. I think one thing that's come out of the pandemic is the the ability for us to be able to communicate and get our feelings and our, and our thoughts over via podcasts, via Zoom meetings, all of that sort of stuff. It's gone to a different level and, and it'd be wrong of us not to, to to grasp that opportunity to be able to spread the word about all sorts of things, all sorts of um, charitable events, awareness, talking about um, things that are going on in football that concern us all. And and the more we talk, the more we communicate, the better human beings will be. So, um, you know, and the fact that it's Arsenal related or anything Arsenal related is obviously very close to my heart and uh, and I'll always support anything. So it's my pleasure to come on today and uh, and to speak to everyone. I love talking about football. So anytime you don't have to worry about it. if you've got something coming up, just just let me know and we can chat about other things. Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I, I think everybody listening can agree that's better than the usual nonsense. Now we'll take a break. Come back, back with a bit today. of the usual nonsense after that. Thanks, Lee. Okay, cheers. Okay, that was obviously Lee Dixon. Uh, just can't thank Lee enough for coming on and taking the time. Uh, so much time, in fact, that I think I'm going to go ahead and put this out as an episode. Um, we have another episode that will come out with the usual crew. And, uh, you know, certainly excited to get that out to you. Obviously, hopefully you are as well, but this is special and, and I want to make sure that uh, it gets its due. I think the thing that stands out to me from that interview is just hearing the pride uh, with which Lee Dixon still speaks about the club and what it clearly still means to him and the values that the the club represent uh, for him and hopefully for the players now and that can be passed down to the fans. So 
I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, and I hope that uh, it inspires you to give in this final day of our, our fundraiser to the Arsenal Foundation. You can go to Just Giving and find it there, or you can go to uh, arsenalvisionpodcast.com forward slash donate, and it'll take you to the Just Giving page, and you can give directly to the Arsenal Foundation and, and support some people that uh, really do benefit immensely from it. So we'll leave it there. You're going to have another podcast uh, virtually right away with um, the usual crew. So there's still plenty to talk about. But more than anything, um, you know, there are days when you do this where you're like, uh, oh, got to talk about the Arsenal again. And then there are days when you do this where you look forward to it. Even when those days come at 4 a.m., uh, this is definitely one of them. So uh, a bucket list day for me and a huge thanks, thanks to Lee for that. So uh, more to come. We love you. We will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Brighton Mill. 